All right, hello, hello everyone, and welcome to our second video in our series about economic growth and sustainable development for Unit 2, Area Study 1 for Economics. Um, today we're going to be looking at how economic growth is measured. So in the first video we looked at just essentially what economic growth is, why it needs to be sustainable, what kind of benefits economic growth brings. We looked a little bit at how it's what economic growth is essentially when we move that production possibility curve outwards. So we can get straight into it and looking at how we measure economic growth. So the most common measure of economic growth is called um, change in GDP, which is called gross domestic product. And most often we look at real GDP, which if you remember from the last video, real means whenever they've taken away the effects of inflation, which is the effects of increasing prices. The reason why we take that out is because it means that it's gonna give us a more accurate indication of if we are actually producing more goods and services overall or a greater value of goods and services overall. Whereas if we didn't take out the effects of inflation, the prices might just increase that it would look like a higher value anyway. So if you look at this little graph off to the side here, which is actually a big graph that's taking up most of the screen, um, this is essentially the last three years of economic growth statistics. There are new ones that should be coming out relatively soon, but they haven't come out yet. So these are as um, basically as recent as possible. And the government tends to have a goal to achieve a level of economic growth annually of three to 3.5%. So as you can see, if we were to like draw a line across that kind of area, that's not half bad for a freehand squiggly line. We've been below that mostly for the last three years, and we've got kind of been going down, then trending up. But the big prediction that's expecting to happen is that we, well, we're now officially the treasurer, Josh Friedenberg, or whatever his name is, said it. We are in a recession, which means that we've had negative growth for two consecutive quarters. So economic growth is going pretty significantly down. So in the January um, quarter, the annual GDP growth statistic was 2.2%. It's expected to be much lower because in that first quarter of the year, we had a negative 0.3% GDP growth, which means we actually, the economy shrunk a little bit and it's expecting that it shrunk even more since then, which makes sense with coronavirus, all the business closures, all the increasing unemployment. Of course, the economy is going to shrink more. And it's probably going to be a decent amount of time before we bounce back. So GDP directly impacts our overall living standards. So GDP represents the total market value of final goods and services produced by a country over a period of time. You definitely need that definition somewhere. You are going to have to define that a decent amount of times in the next two years of your life if you're doing economics this year and next year. So make sure you have that in your notes somewhere that that is what GDP means. And then we've got chain volume GDP, also known as real GDP. Those two things are interchangeable. You most often see it be called real GDP. Measures provide a more accurate indication of changes in real output and expenditures by comparing them to the final value of goods and services produced in the previous year to see the percentage change. And that's when we take out the effects of inflation. We're basically just seeing how much we're growing in comparison to the previous year. So with all different kind of like indicators that we look at in economics, we tend to look at limitations of them because none of them are perfect. There's a lot of issues with a lot of them. So there are a decent amount of limitations for GDP. And I can guarantee you in a SAC situation this year and next year, you're going to be asked about some limitations of GDP as a measurement of economic growth. And so with anything like this, there's five different examples here, but really, you're never going to be asked more than two of them in a SAC situation. So potentially know two of them really well, up to you, find ones that work for you. But one of the first ways that there are limitations to GDP is that it excludes non-marketed production. This is sometimes also referred to as black market production. So anything that happens, and that's, everyone thinks black market just being like drugs, weapons, etc. Um, non-marketed production also just means anything where no tax is paid and the government doesn't essentially get a slice of it. So things like um, do it yourself housework, cash in hand jobs, and then black market type transactions are all non-marketed production. And they all actually do contribute to the economy in some way, but there's no value of it being added onto the economy, which means that it is not giving us the overall figure for GDP that we could potentially have. 
there is inaccurate guesstimations of some types of production. I always say every year I hate the word guesstimations. And because I say that, students tend to use it in their answers as much as they can because they think it's funny to include it in there. But it is an accurate word based on the fact that it's in some of the economics textbooks and therefore you can use it. Um, what this means is that in some areas of production, so a lot of it's in agricultural areas of production where they're selling things in weights and volumes, it's never exact. It's always cl as close as like humanly possible and therefore you're not getting the most accurate figures possible. Uh, GDP also fails to take into account the negative externalities that lower our living standards, our non-material living standards um, overall. So things like usually and quite often producing a lot can actually create more pollution. That's the easiest one to talk about. Or sometimes to get a greater level of economic growth or more GDP, we work more and then we're more stressed. We don't actually have as much leisure time and that hurts our non-material living standards. So there are negative impacts of um, economic growth that can lead to lower living standards overall. And then after this, we have got uh, the need to take in account um, population size. Part of the reason of this is that the population is growing every year, not as fast as it used to grow, but still grows fairly quickly. Um, more people are being born than dying in Australia, and therefore the population gets larger every year. I think we've got about 27 million people in Australia, and that is growing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, essentially, if there are more people, there is more demand for goods and services, therefore more goods and services will be produced, therefore growth will occur. But that doesn't actually mean that you're, you're, you are producing more overall, but there might not be more in comparison to the amount of people. So you might have the population increase by 5%, but only increase production by 2%. And then living standards are actually gonna be worse because people are gonna be fighting over that, um, those goods and services that's gonna drive prices up, et cetera, which is not great for the economy overall. Um, and there's also some failure to take into account um, the variety of goods and, um, and how goods and services and incomes are distributed. So often, when we have strong levels of economic growth, part of the issues with that is that um, essentially, I've been saying essentially a lot today, um, when we have high levels of economic growth, the rich get a better portion of that than the poor or low income earners. So when economic growth is going strong, people who own businesses and companies, they get a high percentage of those profits. Not a lot of it trickles down to the lower levels. So um, when there are high levels of growth, it can actually lead inequalities to get a bit bigger, which in our next topic we'll talk about in a lot more detail, but it can actually make the disparity between um, different parts of the economy worse. Then what we're gonna look at next is some alternative measures of GDP that try and address some of those limitations. So the first one we've got, and the one that I recommend using the majority of the time, because it's the easiest to talk about for fixing one of the limitations of GDP, is real GDP per capita, which is when you take the real GDP um, statistic and divide it by the amount of people in that economy, which gives you a better measure of material living standards or average income earned within that economy. So essentially all you do is get the real GDP figure, divide it by the population, and then you find out basically how many goods and services are being produced per member of that population. And if that number is increasing, well, that's positive because you are growing and you're producing more per person. It still has all the other limitations that apply to real GDP. So black market production, non-market production, guesstimations, etc. But this one's really good to talk about in terms of addressing some of those limitations of GDP. And then we've got one called the genuine progress indicator. With all these alternative measures, all you really need to know is what they are and a bit of a description of them and how they address some of those um, limitations. Hard thing about this is they don't come up in year 12, so it's hard to really push you to know them really, really well, but they are important now. So you need to have a genuine ability to describe them because even then they are useful in some year 12 answers. You just can't be specifically asked about them. So the genuine progress indicator makes adjustments to the GDP figure to reflect positive and negative changes to society's welfare of certain types of spending. So they make deductions for environmental damage um, reduced leisure time due to increased work hours and any inequalities in income distribution. 
and they make additions for ongoing contribution provided by durable items. So the fact that technology these days seems to um, be a lot more durable. So there's been actually a lot of articles coming out this year about the fact that people aren't buying new cars because their old cars just keep going and they don't need to service them as much. They don't need to do much for them. And therefore there's gonna be less production because things are just high quality. Um, and therefore they're still contributing, but if we don't include that contribution, it would actually make the overall level of growth smaller. And also contributions from housework, parenting and voluntary work, etc. And then there are some limitations for this. So the way items are adjusted is relatively subjective. They're putting values on things that don't have values. So that can always be swayed by people's opinions and the accuracy of data used to make the adjustments can be questionable. And then we've got one called the map, which is the measures of Australia's progress, which is not a single measure, but a collection of measures. And they look at four main categories. So they look at individuals, so how health, education, work, culture, and leisure have changed. They look at the economy and economic resources, so how income, housing, productivity, and inflation have changed, how the environment's been affected, and living together, which is all about like family, crime, communication, transport, etc. Um, some of the limitations of this is that it's not a single statistic and some of the measures are in subjective and there's inadequate statistical data a lot overall, but you see how it looks is just over here. Um, basically everything is measured against a baseline and you look at how they are moving forward or back over time to kind of give you an idea of how Australia is progressing in multiple different areas. Um, one of my personal issues with it, it's kind of just, it's a lot. And that's a lot to take into account. Like it's important to take in a lot of these because it gives you a lot more than the non-material aspects of life. But it's a bit more like it doesn't give you a clear statistical figure of if we're doing better or not. And then the very last alternative measure is the Human Development Index, which is a composite statistic which measures performance in three key dimensions of development. So economics, health and longevity, and education. So it looks at these three with different things and kind of decides how we're going as a country based on that. So living standards, so a decent standard of living. Um, we measure that with gross national income, which is GNI per capita, which is similar to GDP, but it adds on income that flows into the home country from people working or owning property abroad. Um, health, so having a long and healthy life, we look at that by um, changing life expectancy at birth and education, we look at that by mean years of schooling or expected years of schooling per person. And they put these three things together to divide how to decide how we're going overall. And um, they call that the human development index. I've honestly, if I was to run an answer, I never use this one because it's just too vague to try and specifically talk about how it addresses some of the issues of economic growth. But there is a bit there which you can unpack and talk about all right, that's it for this video about um, how we measure economic growth through GDP, limitations of it, and alternative measures of GDP. I hope this has been helpful for you. Um, next time we talk, we are going to be looking at, I can't remember, but I'll uh, update that next time. Let's uh, pause and go back. So next time we're going to be looking at aggregate demand and aggregate supply side factors and how they impact economic growth overall. Um, depending on where you are at in your economics journey, you may know those things fairly well or not know them at all. So we'll try and delve in depth into those things. And if you have any questions at all, feel free to leave a comment below or send me a message or send me an email, I'm more than happy to help. And other than that, I hope you have an excellent day and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.